Hello, everybody, and welcome to this, the latest edition in the Export to Japan podcast series. And on this edition, I'm excited to be diving into the world of market research in Japan and looking at how that is such an important factor for you to think about and consider、um, when you are going about looking at your market entry strategy to the Japanese market. And to help us do that, we're delighted to have an amazing guest with us today. It's a gentleman who has 25 years' experience in the general APAC region, and、uh, within that, 15 years' experience in Japan. So he originally hails from Norfolk here in the UK, a beautiful county with a wonderful coastline, but he escaped that many years ago, and、uh, he's been spending his time over in the APAC region. And I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about this topic from today's guest. And welcome, Rupert Sutton from Weben Partners. Good to have you here, Rupert. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you so much to your team for having. Having me here today, it's it's a real pleasure to join you. Oh, it's, you're you're very welcome. And and what part of Japan do we find you in there today? So、Where、I'm in? I'm in Osaka,、um, so that's the second biggest city,、uh, and I'm actually in a district of Osaka called Mino, which is kind of on the northern side of Osaka, not so far from Itami Airport, that which is the domestic airport, and not so far actually from Kyoto, which would be about forty kilometers away from here. So, it's a Mino is a very very nice part of Osaka, and it's a part of Osaka where they don't allow、um, very tall buildings. So it's a really really pleasant place to live. Well, you've you obviously left a beautiful part of the UK, but you're also living in a very beautiful part of Japan now as well. So,、uh, good stuff. Okay. Well, listen, I want to dive in, and,、uh, and my first question really relates to one of the big trends that we are seeing at the moment, and there is a big trend in the growth of, of e-commerce, not just in Japan, all over the world. But for the for the purpose of this discussion, we're focusing on Japan. We're seeing it grow rapidly, and we are seeing. A lot more interest from UK companies to start asking questions about how they can tap into the e-commerce market in Japan. So, bearing that in mind, I wanted to just pick your brains a little bit on what factors do you think are important for UK companies to think about as part of an e-commerce strategy coming into Japan. Yeah, so it's it's a really everything that you said there is absolutely true. So e-commerce here is is growing、um, significantly, though perhaps the penetration of e-commerce here in Japan is not quite as high as what one would see maybe in China or Korea. I, I guess before sort of answering your question specifically,、uh, the first thing we would say to the clients that we work with is that they need to understand something about their shopper behavior. Of the category that they're working in, so e-commerce penetration and e-commerce usage varies significantly by category. So, for example, if you're in the electronics category, e-commerce is really important here, and maybe it'd be about thirty-five, forty percent of sales.、Uh, but if you were say in the confectionery category or snacks, it, it's much lower than that. So, so the first thing you need to understand is for the category that you're in, how significant is is e-commerce? Because you should be thinking about your sales strategy based upon where your shoppers go. As a from the market perspective, rather than me as a manufacturer, I want to sell in e-commerce because it happens to be an easy route to market.、Um, I think the second thing to say is that we also see here in Japan e-commerce being maybe not the first place that people go to buy the product, a new product, but it may be the place that they go to buy the second time. Okay, so it's important to have kind of an omni-channel approach. So I've got some product available offline,、um, but then, so, so for example, in electrical stores, you know, a lot of people go into electrical stores here to look at what's available first because they can see, they can touch, they can feel, they can engage with the product, and then go into the e-commerce e to actually buy. I think the third comment that I'd like to make, and we talk with our clients about getting brilliant basics right with e-commerce. Okay, and so there's quite a lot of things to brilliant basics, but maybe there's there's three things that are particularly important.、Um, one,、um, smartphone usage is really high here, so more people are buying on e-commerce on smartphones than on desktops. So you've got to design a site which 
works on smartphones, tablets, and desktops. So that'd be one of the brilliant basics. The second brilliant basic is, is you've got to get your text content right. Um, so that means you've got to get your titles and your product descriptions and your key wording right to drive search, yeah? And the third kind of brilliant basic is you've got to get your visual content right. So visual content means having the right, what we call hero images for your product. So, you know, and they've got to be optimized for e-commerce because sometimes an image of, let's say, a confectionery pack or something which has got a lot of text on it, when you put it onto an e-commerce platform, it doesn't appear so strongly. So you may want to change or redesign some of your visual images to be optimal for e-commerce. So I think in answer specifically about e-commerce, you've got to get those brilliant basics right. And you've also got to learn how to engage with influencers. You know, Japan's a group culture. It's not an individualistic culture. So everybody's looking at what what opinion leaders are doing. So one of the things that you see at the moment is kind of like an ask me anything type of marketing strategy that brands are following to try and get engagement from shoppers online. Because of course, you've got a lot of people who go onto a site, but then for some reason they drop off, right? Mm. Um, for, for whatever reason. So the more that we can encourage stickiness onto the site, the more that we can get that engagement with the online shopper so that they can un ask questions to the brand, ideally in a live sense. That's, that's really one of the things that you want to be doing to, to, to build that engagement, to get that penetration, meaning that I think especially for a lot of your, your clients, you know, those first time exporters it's, it's about getting new users you know getting yeah. people who've not bought the brand before so therefore the shopper here will have lots of questions so we've got to find ways to engage with the shopper so that we can answer those questions in a meaningful way yeah there's some amazing points that you make there um, Rupert and in fact some I would say some absolute golden nuggets for our uh, for our listeners to to think about um, particularly those that are focused on on coming into Japan on the on the e-commerce side so uh, yeah some great wisdoms you've shared there just to probe into some of those points a little bit deeper one of the areas that I'd like to explore a little bit more relates to the Japanese consumer and, right. and you you know, you, you mentioned the Japanese consumer a couple of times there. My, my first question is, you know, we we hear that Japan is one, you know, absolutely huge market opportunity. And, you know, there's one language out there. It's, it's you know, generally geographically, you know, one kind of location, um, one sort of business uh, practice and one, one culture out there. But I want to put the question to you, is, is that a correct perception or is the market actually fragmented and should there be other considerations that international companies should think about when they're developing their market entry and, and marketing strategies? It's a great question. I mean, in my opinion, based on the categories that I've worked in, so coffee, pet food, confectionery, ice cream, OTC products, packaged fruit and others. So I've worked in all of those categories here in Japan. I personally believe the market is fragmented and there's, there's a number of reasons that I say that. One, in every single one of those categories, there's literally thousands of SKUs, meaning products. Some of the products are national, some of the products are regional, some of the products are sold in certain channels only, some are sold only online, some are sold only in catalogues. Um, I think it's also, this is my opinion, but I, I think it on the one side, you can look at Japanese consumers and you can say, you know, it's a heterogeneous group. Um, but actually, if you look at behavior, so for, let's say, for example, voting, um, around 50% of the population votes in a general election. So it's a lot lower than Britain, for example. So there's 50% of people who don't vote. And then if you look at the number of political parties here, it's probably more than in the UK. So there's a lot more fragmentation on a political sense. If you look at, say, car ownership, 
car ownership nationally runs at around 70% in Japan, but there's some prefectures where car ownership's much higher. It's a lot lower, so not maybe not surprisingly, in places like Tokyo and here in Osaka, uh, but there's some prefectures more rural, Hokkaido, Fukui Prefecture, and so on, um, where car ownership's a lot higher. Um, 24% of Japanese have a passport. Um, so, you know, it's one of the lowest, actually, for, for the industrial world. So, you know, there's an image that, you know, Japanese people are traveling a lot. Um, I mean, what's, what it is, is the case is that there are the same people who are traveling a lot, and there's even more people who don't travel at all. Mm. So... In my opinion, I think the market is complex and fragmented. And probably what does that mean? You know, that's probably the bigger question. What does that mean for, for an exporter? Um, it means we have to really understand very clearly who we're going to target and understanding how they're going to behave. Because if we target the wrong people, our efforts will be completely wasted. I, I mean, here, here's another example, pet care. 20% of Japanese households own a pet. So if I target the wrong people, I could be targeting people who don't own pets, in which case all the money that I spend or all the time that I spend, even if I don't spend money on advertising, all the time that I spent could be directed completely in the wrong area. So it, it does mean that it's really important to decide who to target. Mm. Um, and mm. yeah, so, so I do believe the market's fragmented and, and really understand, making sense of that fragmentation is really important. And for example, one of the things we do with clients it tends to be the bigger companies is we build up what we call a segmentation model um, of different consumer groups um, and profile them against demographics, against lifestyle, against spend. And you can, you can see very significant differences in behavior, um, even amongst people who use the category. Um, right. So, yes, I mean, it is important to understand. Yeah, expanding this point a, a little bit, Rupert, because you're touching on so many interesting you know, topics and points there. Again, thinking about the the, the 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 listeners that we have to this podcast, right. there'll be a good portion of them that will be UK companies that are just looking at Japan for the first time, right? So right. they have very little knowledge and they're, they're, they're here to learn. Um, so to, you, again, you know, touching on the Japanese consumers, what, what comments would you make from a general point of view of how Japanese consumers may differ to UK consumers, for example? Are there any key points that you would bring out there? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing, I suppose the first answer to that is, is there aren't all differences. There are there are some similarities. Of course, they're, they're humans. Of course, Japan's also an island country, just like the UK. It's also an old country, just like the UK. Now, the traditions, of course, are different, but because of that age and that history in those respective countries, that also gives some underlying cultural similarities in my personal opinion. Also, the languages are very different, but Japanese people are very proud of the Japanese language, just as I think English people are very proud of, you know, our, our English heritage and all our great authors and so on. Um, but there are differences. I mean, so, so for example, there's some physical differences. I mean, Japanese people tend to be slightly shorter. They tend to, they tend to in my opinion, um, keep better care of their health. Life expectancy here is longer. There's a much greater awareness of health. They go to the doctor, the Japanese, average Japanese consumer goes to the doctor 11 times a year. That's over double what happens in the UK, for example. Um, they shop more frequently. Um, most people shop three or four times a week for general groceries, uh, whereas in the UK, it tends to be about once or twice a week. Um, they tend to go to closer places to where they're living rather than driving away. Um, there's and so on. Um, mm. They tend to stay in 
when pe Japanese people buy a house, now the house ownership ratios are slightly different. They're slightly lower here in Japan than, than in Britain, uh, but they tend to stay in a, a house even if they're renting it for much longer. I think in the UK, it's on average about four or five years. Japan will be double, if not longer than that. Um, there's a concept here called Tanshin Funin. I don't know whether you, do you remember that from your time here? I don't, no, no. So, so Tanshin, like Tanshin Funin is a concept of like, you know, if I'm, if we're in a, if we, if you were married and your company says to you, okay, I need to dispatch you to another part of Japan. Now, by the way, that's a very common thing that Japanese companies do. They'll move people from one part of Japan to another. Now, in the UK, people would be going, oh, well, I need to have a discussion <laughs> about that, or you know, that's not part of my contract, or whatever. Um, here, uh, the employment laws generally are such that if you sign up to work for a company and you, they ask you to move from Osaka to Sapporo tomorrow, you have to go. I mean, okay. it's not it's yeah, not exactly really negotiable. <laughs> but, and so in many cases, the the husband will go, but the wife and the children wouldn't go. So that's called Tanshin Funin. Um, so there are some, of course, some very different um, things, you know, societal differences that evolve as a result of that um i mean yeah. generally as far as consumer products are concerned you know japanese people don't like things that are so sweet they don't like sugary things they like more natural products to be honest with you um so there's some very different organoleptic issues and i because i spent a lot of my time in the food industry here most of the brands that we've worked with end up having cha to change formulas, packaging, claims for the Japanese market and not for you know regulatory reasons. So there, there are regulatory issues as well, but they'll be they'll be simply because they've tested the products with the consumers and they find that there's so for example, Smarties, you know, which is a very popular you know, confectionery brand mm. in, in Britain or like M&M's, you know, which are competitor. You can't find it here. Um, mums won't buy it. Um, they think that it's too, the colourings are too bright, too artificial. As the, it's got very, you know, it doesn't resonate here, here at all. Um, so there are some, you know, These you get into the products, you know, they're... Yeah. So for the UK companies, you know, if you're a UK company, you have to ask yourself or, you're, you know, you want to come to Japan, you have to ask yourself, you know, am I going to take this vanilla approach, am I, which is basically, this is what I've got, this is what I'm going to give you. Um, now, that can work to a certain extent. Um, but if you want to get big sales in Japan, meaning you want to be available across a number of channels, and you want to have tens of millions of pounds worth of business then you are going to have to make adaptations for the local market just in the same way actually that Japanese companies who are selling in the UK are doing and they are making changes for the UK market if you look at like Clearspring for example in the UK it's a very famous company mm -hmm. um, selling Japanese food but the some of the things that they're selling um you know, have been changed for the UK market as well. You may not know that, but they have. I mean, uh, on that point, Rupert, I mean, what I would say from your summary there is the, the one of the strong messages that's clearly emerging from this discussion that is so blatantly clear, it does come back to this key point that we said of the importance of research and all of these factors you're talking about of understanding your market, knowing your customers, working out where you're going to go, working out how to get there, you know, they, they are key fundamental questions. And even these points, great points you're making now about even thinking about your product offering, whatever it may be, you know, is it the, is it the right product offering or what adaptations do you need to make to it? Um, they're all key, key points that point back to this thing about having knowledge and information and doing the right research, which, you know, I, I know a lot of companies think that that's painful and expensive, but, but I think we know in reality, you save yourself a lot of money and a lot of time if you get this stuff right, you know. So. And I think that's also one of the questions that, you know, an exporter would be, should ask themselves before they seriously look at Japan, which is that on the one side, it's a big market. There's no question about that. There's 125 million people here, 
spending power is here and you can have very very big sales and there's a number of foreign companies who've done really really well here but you're gonna it's not going to be a monday morning or friday afternoon job it's mm. going to be a full-time and serious commitment and you have to ask yourself as a company am i prepared to get into that nitty-gritty or if not I'd be honestly and say to the companies, and we do sometimes say it to, to clients, um, you're better off, you know, looking at other opportunities right. um, yeah. because it's going to take up a lot of time and you've got to make sure you've got the people on your team who've got the skills and capability to do that as well. Understood, yeah. Now, on that, on the point you just made there about the size of the, of, the, of the market, that's another point I wanted to touch on with you because I know when I've heard you speak previously, you've made some really interesting points about... Um, the niches in Japan and, and how right. big those can be, for example. So could you just share, you know, a, a few thoughts and wisdoms on that, on that from your perspective, please? Yeah. So my, my opinion is that, you know, to be successful here um, because of the competition, um, you know, you've obviously got to have something which is really strong and like a core competency based around what you're good at doing, your product offering, your branding and so on. I mean, a few examples, I mean, I was looking today at like car sales here in Japan. I mean, so like last year, um, there's four and a half million cars sold here. So, you know, it's a big number, uh, even in the pandemic, you know, four and a half million cars. And like Mercedes would have one of the top brand awareness would be really almost every Japanese consumer knows Benz. That's what they call it here. Um, but, you know, the sales of Mercedes last year, 51,000 cars out of four and a half million. So it's less than 1% share. Um, but it's probably the most famous brand of foreign cars. BMW would be the same. In fact, their sales are slightly lower than Mercedes. Um, Nespresso. Um, Nespresso has been really big here. I mean, Nespresso sales would be like, um, over $50 million at least here in Japan. Yet there's maximum 250,000 households out of 49 million households so 49 million you know because you've got married couples and so on so again less than one percent so you've got 250,000 households who've got an espresso machine um that there's more households who've got another type of coffee machine but even so it's still not 10 or 20 percent maximum 20 percent of households would have a, a specialist coffee machine yet those brands whether they're an espresso whether they're a benz or a bmw have been very successful and are very profitable here so that's why i i believe that really focusing on a core target group and then getting you've gone then got to get this that's kind of why i'm waving my hand you've got to kind of get that repeat sale from those key customers who are coming back time and time again and that's what's going to give you your your volume and your stability here in japan if you can get those loyal customers that's and it. there's certain british brands who've done that too look at burberry look at barber especially like in the fashion area look at Ooh. dr martins dr Ooh. martins is really big here again really core focus you know 1960s yeah. 1970s you know fashion um yet the brand has become big and it's remained contemporary through clever marketing so that that's what i think you should do if you yeah. want to be successful Great advice and great thoughts. And again, just sort of taking the flow on and thinking about some of those amazing companies that you mentioned and how, how they've become successful, even if they're in a little bit of a niche, it's still hugely successful, as you said. Um, what, what about innovation? That's another thing we hear a lot about, innovation pipeline and developing products and ranges and things. Again, yeah. could you share your, your experience it's, on that? It's important for a number of reasons. It's important in the offline world, because if you're being sold in supermarkets or convenience stores, those retailers are changing layouts at least twice a year. In terms of convenience stores, they're changing them every month. Okay, And if your product doesn't meet 
a sales hurdle. And Sainsbury's and Tesco in the UK do exactly the same thing. If you don't meet the sales hurdle, you're out. So you've got to have an innovation and renovation pipeline. Now, on, on the e-commerce platform, and I know that's a particular interest for you, that's arguably even more important because the rankings of products on e-commerce are changing every day, not every week or every month. They're changing more frequently. So you've got to continue to have new news in terms of innovations to be to keep your shelf space, whether it's the digital shelf or the physical shelf. Um, and you've got to be part of that. And the consumer here is used to that. Um, they are used to this um, rapid new product flow of new products. So, so you've kind of got to have that innovation and renovation pipeline. It's one of the key success factors um, to, in consumer products. Now, you can manage it in your mix because you can have kind of like pillar products, you know, and that's what Dr. Martins has done. They've got three or four sort of pillar products, but then every year they're coming out with these seasonal limited editions, you know, whatever. So they kind of, through a combination of pillars, what I call pillar and filler strategy, they're, they're keeping that momentum, they're keeping that news, they're keeping that engagement, they, they're, they're able to go back to the, the customers and, and the opinion leaders with something new, and therefore seen, seen coming across as being fresh and contemporary. Yeah, thank you for that, Rupert. And, you know, I, I think the overwhelming message that's clearly coming out here is the need to do some good quality market research um, in, in advance of entering the market and developing your strategy and, and get the right information. And, and it's clear that from so many different angles that that's such an important thing to do. So as we come towards the sort of conclusion of this discussion, there's a couple more questions I'd just like to, to ask you. Um, and I want to, finally, I, I want to come on to your company and understand a little bit more about the services and how you can help international companies. But before I do that, just one question, a sort of one layer above that is, for international companies looking at the Japanese market that are realizing the need to have some market research, what advice would you give them in general on how they can go about finding and working with the right market research partner in Japan? Yeah, okay. So, well, the first thing that I'd say to a company is actually there are a lot of things you can find out yourself um, before engaging us so they could talk to you because um, I think you've got some excellent networks and some excellent information. Um, for example, um, they could talk to other people, other companies in their industry who've got experience of Japan. Maybe, maybe people like yourself could help facilitate some of those introductions as well. Um, if you're going to engage, of course, the other thing that we would encourage companies to do is to come here. Um, and, and there's no there's no substitute for kind of like a look see trip. Now it's a little difficult at the moment with COVID, though we have heard this week the borders are going to be uh, restrictions are going to be listed. So you can come here for like a week or a couple of weeks um, and kind of immerse yourself in the market. And we do that with some clients, by the way. Um, that can be almost more productive than just you know calling up a market research company and asking for a report because. You know, research companies tend to want to sell a specific product, whether it's like some focus group research or buy this off the shelf report or buy this, you know, retail audit or whatever. So I think you, you need to engage with a partner who can kind of give you that more holistic view to try and understand understand how that category that you're going to work with in Japan works here. I mean, that's why it's important to, because the, the dynamics of the categories vary so significantly within the market. Um, and you can't, you, you can't guess that. So you've got to work with a company who's got the experience of being able to give you that holistic view, not just of how the consumer works, but also how the trade side works, whether that's the online business or the offline business. Um, so you need to work with a partner who, who, can, who can help you with that piece too. That's it. Good, good advice there. And then that, that dovetails in really nicely to my final question, which is really just, just to understand a little bit more about um, your organization and, and what you do. And in particular, what are the right kind of companies that you feel would be well suited that, that you could help and support? So we've been partners. We're basically working. So we have a business in Japan. Well, we've got associates all around Asia Pacific. We have company in Singapore. We also have a company in Australia. We also have a company in the UK. 
Um, basically, we're working with consumer products companies, um, food companies, healthcare companies, retailers, and so on. And we're really working on three types of projects. One is called insights. So it's about understanding consumers, shoppers, customers, channels, competitors. The second thing that we do is we work with companies to interpret those insights to put together this product portfolio, branding. We talked about making changes to products for Japan. We also working with companies on what we call route to market, which is what's the right sales model or sales models that we should be following in a particular country. And the third thing that we do is we write capability programs. We tend to be for bigger companies. So for example, I talk about Brilliant Basics, you know, that's, that's we wrote a global e-commerce program recently for a French company. Um, and that was one of the things that we, we, we emphasized heavily in, in the work that we did with them, for example. So we, we, we write training programs about shopper marketing, about managing distributors, um, about brand management, category management, that sort of thing. And I've also got some training programs on, on a site called Export and Expand, if anybody wants to have a look at that. Um, but I'm not here to sell my services. Sure. No, we appreciate that. But I mean, the, the one thing that's come across so clearly in this discussion, Rupert, and you know, really do appreciate you taking the time out to join us. Your 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 twenty five years experience in the region, and your fifteen years or so experience in Japan. Um, clearly, you've picked up so much knowledge and experience, and uh, and and through this very brief chat, that's that message has come across so so strongly, and uh, and I hope you know, and I'm sure we have given the, the, the listeners um, a great insight into all the various factors of why doing some good quality market research is such an important thing to do. And um, before you dive in and start making your detailed plans and start spending your money and making relationships. So that, that's definitely the, the big takeaway. And, and I would certainly, you know, in, in terms of our appreciation to you, I would say thank you so much for, for, for giving your time. Well, thank you uh, so much really for helpful. giving your time to me. And, uh, so, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to appear i really appreciate that um and i'm really excited about the things that you guys are doing here as well so hopefully there'll be some opportunities that we can work together too i'm, I'm sure there will i've got no doubt about that at all and uh, and thank you for those kind words as well it's uh, it's mutually appreciated definitely and i would just say to our to our listeners listening in you know i hope you have found that very valuable i think there's a whole wealth of golden nuggets that Rupert has shared with us there, and uh, um, and it's probably provoked some you know thoughts for you. I hope it has provoked some thoughts. Um, you can reach out to Rupert, of course. You've got an idea of his capability and what he and his his uh, organisation can do. Um, as Rupert mentioned, we are here to help you at export to Japan as well. Um, we can either help you with any questions or direct you in in any any di direction to other partners that we know of that may be able to help you, including our colleagues at the trade team at the British Embassy in Tokyo. Thank you. And uh, just as a final summing up, I would like to say, you know, a lot of us are putting a lot of effort into producing this content and putting it out there for you. Um, and it's our, it's our pleasure to do it. The only thing I would love to ask in return, if you wouldn't mind hitting that like button, if you've enjoyed this video today, and, uh, and of course, subscribing to our channel, because we have lots more content uh, coming up. And uh, if you subscribe, you'll get notified of the next podcast that we plan. So if you wouldn't mind doing that in return, that would be hugely appreciated. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>